Liz, along with husband Peter, took up permanent residence at Salamander early this year. Peter is the director of the Roach Racket Resort, while Liz is the resort's touring professional. In Seoul, Liz is one of three Australians who will play in the women's singles. The 25-year-old gets a second bite at the medal, playing in the doubles as well. Most of the world's best will be at the games, with Liz an outside chance of a medal in the singles. The doubles, however, is where the Dynamo has her best chance. A former Wimbledon doubles champion and US mixed doubles title holder, Liz will team up with veteran Wendy Turnbull in her quest for gold. Well, Wendy and I have played on several occasions before and done quite well. So hopefully um, we'll keep the flag flying and, and uh, it'll be a good challenge. It's something different for tennis players, but uh, yeah, it'll be a good challenge for us. You certainly won't be the youngest combination in Seoul. <laughs> no, no, Wendy's um, getting up there and I'm not as young as a lot of the girls on the women's tour, but um, experience counts for a lot. <laughs> Do you believe an Olympic gold medal will one day rival Wimbledon in prestige? I don't know, I think Wimbledon I think would always be the greatest thing that you can do in tennis, me personally. And I think it's probably harder to win you know, a big Grand Slam event um, you know, like Wimbledon or the US Open rather than the Olympics right now. I don't know, maybe in, in X amount of years time it might be, but I can't see it in the, in the near future. Well, first started when my father built a table tennis table in the garage and we, I played with my brother there and we went to my first tournament when I was nine years old and I won the under 12 state championships and of course I was winning all those tournaments. I thought, I thought this was a fantastic game and I just kept playing. And winning Gary has continued to do. At 23, he has been state open champion since 1985 and national open title holder since 86. Currently ranked number one in Australia, Gary has represented Australia 92 times. He is also ranked number two in Oceania and seventh in the Commonwealth. Gary's main practice partner is his brother Robert. He's also no slouch with a bat, having twice won the Australian University Championship. He's the only practice partner I've got in Newcastle and he comes down and helps me a lot, especially for the Olympics, and I appreciate that very much. What if only 64 players have qualified for the event in Seoul, and unlike many events, it won't be a knockout competition. With 64 players, they're going to have eight groups of eight, so therefore you play all, all the eight players, and then uh, the first of each group will then go into another group with the other first, and the seconds and thirds and fourths and so on, so everyone will then get a placing from one to 64. Are you familiar with most of the players you'll be playing against? Yeah, I've seen them all there before. I've been to uh, three World Championships now. I've uh, represented Australia a few times and, and I've seen them all there. I'm very familiar with them. Out of 64, how do you think you'll go? Well, just looking at the names I received um, a couple of weeks ago, it's very difficult. If, if I can get in the top 30 or 25, I'll be very happy. OK, then. Matt Ryan lives and breathes horse riding. He works at the New South Wales Equestrian Centre at Lochinvar, where he's a student coordinator. At 24, he's one of the youngest ever to be selected in the Australian Olympic equestrian team. In Seoul, Matt will compete in three-day eventing, which is one day each of dressage, cross-country and show jumping. It's a fairly all-round event for you and the horse. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's, the horse has got to be able to be very supple and trainable as the flat work. Got to be very fit and in, uh, have a lot of endurance for the cross country, and also uh, got to be neat enough and tidy enough in the third day to come out and go clean, hopefully, in the show jumping. Going to Seoul with Matt will be his 11 year old horse, Southland of Kula Lee, bred by Matt's parents at Black Hill. He's good. Uh, he's, he's a really hard, tough sort of character, uh, and um, I think he's up to it. Oh, yeah. I believe he's a, a, an Andalusian cross, so yeah, a lot of people don't use those. OK, yeah, and, and he's the first cross Andalusian out of a thoroughbred. Um, no, they're not that common, uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, My parents brought out an Andalusian stallion, I must be 15, 16 years ago, and started breeding these cross-bred Andalusians. And um, I find them great to work with, 
uh, there's not some of them aren't big enough, but the few that are big enough, I've been very successful with, and I hope to um, yeah be successful again internationally. Do you think you've got what it takes to get a medal? Oh hell yeah! <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah. No, I think if you don't believe in yourself, you, you know, you're wasting your time, and I definitely believe I'm capable of doing it. Yeah. Greg Heyman has been weightlifting for more than 10 years. He started at 18 in unusual circumstances. Well, a friend of mine uh, had a motorbike accident and after he recovered from the, uh, the plaster, he needed some physiotherapy and, and muscle work. So we attended the gym at uh, Mayfield, Joe Hintz's gym. And, um, after he finished up, I started doing weightlifting and the coach there sort of grabbed me and wouldn't let me go. So that was the way it began all those years ago. And you've been doing it ever since? Yeah, well, I had a, a couple of years off when I got married, um, but then I came back again. And since the 82, I've been going flat out. Can you tell me a little bit about the controversy surrounding uh, the Olympic selection trials? Well, the selection committee at first uh, told us 12 months ago there was four trials. Uh, we must compete to a certain level, um, which I did in all those competitions plus other competitions. Um, but on the day, they decided uh, they'd only take that day's performance into a account which was disappointing because I uh, failed to make a total and therefore I was uh, subsequently uh, dropped from the team but uh, with my world ranking as at the time was uh, <clears throat> ninth um, I think they felt ashamed of leaving me behind and our selectors sort of had a word for them and they put me in about two hours later. Greg will compete in the 52 kilogram division the lowest weight category in the sport. Being in a, a weight division sport like this, uh, you find it difficult, uh, as I guess jockeys do, keeping your weight below that 52 kilogram mark? Well, actually I don't ever keep it to 52 kilos. I'm always training at least three to four kilos overweight. Uh, and the week before the competition, I'll drop that four kilos, uh, ready to compete on, say, on the Saturday. So I really don't hold it to 52. What's your future when Seoul's finished? I might have a day or two off and then I'll uh, start my preparation for the Commonwealth Games in Auckland. While he won a gold medal at the Edinburgh Commonwealth Games, he is realistic when it comes to his chances in Seoul. Well, I'm hoping for a top 10 placing. I'd be quite satisfied with 10th, to be honest. And I think anyone in Australia, <coughs> excuse me, would uh, think the same. That'd be quite a good result for anyone. Chris Lawrence is a real chance of a medal in South Korea. In the pre-Olympics last year at Prasan, Chris was running third until his boom broke, putting him out of the regatta. The 20-year-old from Lizaro has only been sailboarding five years, but has won three world championships. Chris didn't get much of a training run the day we shot this, in conditions that could almost be called calm. There's only uh, one person from each country, um, which which is the best, the best sailor from each country, so the standard of competition is really high. Would you have sailed against many of these uh, people before? Yeah, it's the same, it's the same people I see at uh, all the regattas in Asia and Europe. It's just the um, same people in different places each time. When you get your sailboard, the one they hand out to all the competitors, do you especially rig it up? Uh, well, everyone rigs their sail different. Um, there's your boom height, uh, you have that to suit your own your own height and um, sail depth and that changed just uh, between different people. So it, the way you rig the craft can be the difference between winning and losing? Uh, yeah, well you, if you rigged it really bad you, it's definitely going to make a, a difference to how you're going to place. What sort of conditions are you expecting at Pusan? Um, well I've been there last year and seen the conditions so it's very similar to what we have here off Terrigal or um, off Sydney Heads. Are they the conditions you'll be hoping for? Um, well, it's the conditions we're going to really get, so it doesn't really matter. How are you hoping to go in Seoul? Um, well, I hope to win, of course, but um, that'll all depend on the conditions and um, how I feel in the day. You said before you'd, you'd competed against most of the people you'll be uh, racing against in Seoul. Have you beaten most of them? 
Oh, yes, I've, well, I've beaten them and they've beaten me. It's sort of a oh, mixed, 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 mixed placings. Are we going to see you coming back with a with a medal, even a gold medal? Um, hopefully I'll, I'll bring home a medal. Oh, gold would be good, of course, but um, any medal would be fine. <laughs> The Olympics are nothing new to Don Brook. In 1972 he competed in Munich and in 76 went to Montreal. He has also represented Australia at three Commonwealth Games, winning a silver medal at Edinburgh two years ago. Shooting internationally since 1969, Don has also won numerous World Cup events and is the holder of the world record of a perfect 400 score in the 40 shot prone event, which is competed in a lying position. In Seoul, Don will turn 50 on the day of the opening ceremony. He will be the oldest on the range and will compete in the 60-shot prone as well as the three position. In the months leading up to the Olympics, Don has been training up to 30 hours a week. The sport centres around you being steady. What do you do to calm your nerves? Oh, that's mental. It, it's a um, process that I use. Uh, I use a lot of imagery with it. Like I've got a pet seagull or a pet pelican that flies around and he gives me the sort of image of, of skimming across a smooth lake and it, that calms me down. Um, controlling of pressure is, or anxiety in shooting is very, very important and probably one of the best ways that I can do that if I can feel it building up is to monitor what my arousal curve is and I try and keep that on the peak of it. So, you know, if I feel that I'm getting too uptight or I'm starting to shoot tight, I can feel my muscles tightening up. It's just a mental process to bring them back down and relax again and start again. The master marksman's secret weapon is his state-of-the-art Novastock rifle, developed and built by himself. In Seoul, one in every five of the 80 competitors in the small bore event will be using a Don Brook made rifle. And, uh, I think that the rifle that I'm using is, is currently the most accurate small bore rifle in the world. And um, that's mainly because of the barrel, I think, but the, the actual Nova stock, aluminium stock on the thing is working very, very well with it just now. I've got it tuned properly and it's shooting exceptionally tight grips. As you can see by that, it's a 10 shot grip. It's a bit vertical, but it's a 10 shot grip. So, you know, it's shooting somewhere around about the 8 to 12 mil class without any problems at all. Could you do yourself out of a medal by having sold your Nova stocks to uh, some of the world's best competitors? Oh, that's possible, I suppose. <laughs> you know, I won't sort of mind if, if um, one of the competitors is shooting and Overstock wins it or beats me with it, but I want to win that medal so bad I can taste the thing. And uh, really, that's what I want to do. And um, I don't think that their rifles are any better than what mine is, but it will prove who's going to be the best rifle shot on the day, won't it? Sol will be 35-year-old Vicky's second Olympics. Four years ago in Los Angeles, the NBN Sports Star of the Year competed unsuccessfully in the three-day eventing, but this time will be in the show jumping. It's been a big 18-month build-up for Vicky. Last year she won the Grand Prix of Rome and helped Australia win the prestigious Nations Cup also in Rome. I've got a fair idea of what the competition's going to be like. Uh, I competed against all the top riders and uh, it's going to be tough. It always is at Olympic Games. While you're in Europe, did you beat most of them? Well, in the Grand Prix of Rome, yes, I did. I had a wonderful run. I beat the uh, previous gold medalist in Los Angeles on his horse. I beat the winner of the World Cup a few weeks previously on her horse. So it was it was a wonderful, wonderful win. It proved that the Australian horses and riders are among the best in the world. However, since then, Vicky has sold her world-beating horse Apache. In Seoul, she will be on a new horse, Mickey Mouse. Tell me, you're coming back from Seoul with a medal? Can but try. I, I think the team's in with a pretty big chance. I, I don't know about my individual chances because I say this horse is a little short of experience. It really needs my experience, I think, to help him. Uh, but the team is a very strong one and, and we're allowed to go because the AOF thought we're in with a big chance of finishing in the top six and I'm very confident that we'll do that. To get a medal, we'll just need that ounce of luck.
So that's all we need on the day. Vicky had just Vicky's arrived from Sydney this from morning on a special cargo flight with the rest of the equestrian New Zealanders or Australia's main Seoul, rivals Vicky in the equestrian events almost bitten, bitten off by a New Zealand horse. The wound the requiring, requiring 20, 20, stitches, 20 stitches but will not affect her riding when horse. competition starts. Oh. <laughs> Twenty-six-year-old Torpy will team up with old friend Colin Beeshell as the Australian representative in the star class to be raced in the waters off Busan. The pair have been training and racing together for 12 months and have just returned from a successful series of regattas in Europe. We aim to get up with the top guys in competition levels and we're a little bit off the pace when we first got there. By the end of our 10-week campaign we're up with the good guys and maintaining a good competitive level right through the the race. Just look at you, looking at you, you're, you're a big man, uh, that isn't a disadvantage in a, in a boat race, wouldn't it be the lighter crew the better? Not in star class, they're looking for fairly big forward hands and also you've got to be fairly agile to move around the boat, so most of the guys are pretty large and they've got to work on their uh, agility through the boat and that makes the difference. Do you know many of the competitors you'll be lining up against in Seoul, rather in Fasan? The majority are now after the European campaign. During our campaign, the people were selected as we were over there. So one by one, we knew who we were up against. Uh, we have raced against them through, the, uh, through Europe. And we've beaten everybody so far, at least once, by the Americans. We haven't come up against the Americans yet, all the Canadians, and they're both pretty good. Well, by the sounds of that, you must be confident of a medal. Um, it's a very, very tough class, a star class, and there's going to be 20 boats out there, very, very good, but we believe there's eight boats with a chance and we're one of those eight boats. Under the Olympic qualifying time, Donna's she's build up to the, the game has been nothing record. short of she's phenomenal. About, uh, Training four five to six hours a day, the 18 year old has been swimming between 60 ago. and 70 kilometres per week. At the Olympic the selection place. trials, and, uh, Donna was the star, in, in setting a new Commonwealth uh, record in the 400 metres individual medal. Certainly Donna Proctor's race, and she's coming into a great time. 52 is the qualifying time. Have a look at this. 45, sensational performance. She's off to Seoul. New Commonwealth record. As well as the 400 metres Downs, medley, 19. Donna will compete now, in the 200 metres medley. 50, the fly, it's also expected the that Donna time. will get it's a start in the 200 metres butterfly, seconds. an event her coach believes she can make the final end as well. The way there in 200 three, butterfly, I think we're here, can be a great for this event. Is the I'm not sure just, just how fast she can go over the 200. Over in lane 6 is the medley. would indicate that she's a problem with the 211. That's a lovely final shot there for Donna Proctor at the moment. But there's a long way to go. It's Jet. hard to sprint real fast at that height and weight, but uh, certainly she's a, a finalist chance in the 200 butterfly as well. Donna's best chance of a medal is in the 400 metres individual medley. Sweetenham says she will certainly lower her Commonwealth record time, which could put her amongst the medals. Donna herself is also quietly confident of bringing a medal back to Newcastle. At the moment I hope to make a final in the 400 medley. If I make a final, well, I'll see what happens from there. Is the medal out of the question? Um, if I get into the final, I don't think it'll be out of the question, but I've got to make the final first. It was an occasion few people who'd ever had anything to do with the Redhead Public School wanted to miss. Eight years old, the school had plenty of celebrating to do and lots of remembering too. For 86-year-old Stella Bull and Doris Heath, 83, must have brought back a flood of memories as they joined together once again to cut the birthday cake. Both were featured in the school's very first photograph, taken back in 1911. That photograph and other memorabilia telling of the history of the school and the Redhead District made up a nostalgic display in, appropriately, the school's oldest building. Held indoors due to the unpredictable weather, today's birthday ceremony also included the presentation of the school's time capsule.
Federal Industrial Relations Minister and Redhead PNC patron Peter Morris. That capsule would be planted in the school library and not in the ground, a decision made after the last long forgotten Redhead public capsule was unwittingly dug up and dumped during excavation work. chapter. There to do the official honours was State Transport Minister Bruce Baird, who used the opening as a his government's commitment to improving roads in New South Wales, though he later humbly conceded most of the work was carried out under the supervision of the former Labor government. And it involves three bridges and uh, uh, three pedestrian overbridges as well. Uh, quite a significant piece of roadworks. Mm. Uh, do you think it's a sign of, of your government's commitment to roads? Well, it also should be would be fair to say that a lot of the work was carried out under, under the previous government, but we are certainly going to give a major commitment to roadworks during the four years of government. On the official plaque, it stated the bypass would end the noise, congestion and pollution which the New England Highway had brought to make the CBD, but it would also play an important role in the unlikely field of preservation. Years of traffic had begun to take their toll on Maitland's historic homes and buildings and it's hoped the reduction will now expand their lifespan. But while today's opening may have been a pleasurable occasion for the Transport Minister, the threat of a less than pleasurable encounter is looming for him today with a talk of yet another truckies blockade. Two months after hundreds of giant rigs jammed Australia's major highways in a protest for a better deal for truckies, the drivers are demanding more from the state and federal governments. If not, they'll resort to the same action again, a threat which has failed to impress Mr Baird. If they want to talk to me today, I'm happy to talk to them, but when uh, or if they call a blockade, there is no point in us talking. We're not going to condone that type of illegal activity and disrupting the traffic flow, the interstate transport of goods across our borders and within the state. It just is really totally unacceptable and totally not on. Okay, did Charlestown Community Support Service has realised the importance of equipping young people with the necessary skills. A community-based program called Skillshare has been devised with the purpose of amalgamating Charlestown CIS with Skillshare. Last night, organisers showed off this innovative job scheme, with students and graduates of the program displaying their newly acquired skills to business people, politicians and a range of future employers. Students hosted the evening, preparing the meal and providing first-class table service and entertainment, a task which went far in promoting Skillshare. Focus of the program is on the specific labour market needs of Lake Macquarie and the Hunter, utilising recent development interest in the area as a guide to future job vacancies. Guests last night included the Minister for Employment and area. Education Services, Peter Duncan, on who praised Charlestown's new school share program, describing and, uh, it as a model it for long, others I don't to think follow. That, uh, Charlestown CIS has been one of the success stories of uh, the CIS projects. I think that it can be fairly said that this project could have been the model for the new Skillshare project. 